I'm Katie Poolbeam and you're watching Venture Capital. Coming up, Russia bites back and we talk food as Moscow responds to international sanctions. And we also look into the potential consequences of banning European flights crossing airspace to Asia. Also, Russia and Iran team up and agree to an oil trade deal understanding to ease the impacts of such sanctions. And Tim Kirby joins me later. He's going to be talking about beer. But first, the Russian government has imposed a one-year restriction on the import of agricultural products from the country's imposing sanctions. So, beef, pork, poultry, fish, cheese, milk, vegetables and fruit imports from Australia, Canada, the EU, US and Norway are all off the menu. But the drinks menu is still OK. Alcohol is not affected. Neither is baby food. Now, in 2013, Russia imported $6.7 billion worth of meat and meat products in total. So we're talking about a lot of money here. So to discuss this issue and the new bite back measures, I'm now joined by Alexei Sokolov, head of the learning center whotrades.com. Alexei, these measures are designed to hit back. The question is, how hard are they going to hit back and who are they actually going to hit back? Uh, the funny part of uh, these measures uh, is that uh, Russia are not going to hit back. Uh, Russia just trying to protect uh, their own agriculture sector and, and uh, uh, own economy. In fact, uh, these uh, sanctions going to uh, hit European Union a lot. It's uh, going to hit Poland, Finland, and uh, uh, all other countries who are providing agricultural uh, products for Russian market. So presumably, Alexei, the Russian farmer is going to be the biggest winner in all of this. I think this year will be much more profitable for Russian farmers than uh, last year. And uh, maybe it will be the best year for them uh, from, uh, from all years uh, uh, beginning of uh, 90s. OK, but what about European farmers then? For the average Polish farmer, for example, somebody in the Baltics, what do they do now? Where do they sell their goods to? Are they going to have to really ramp up their exports back to their homeland, to Europe, domestically? What will happen to them? Uh, I think uh, European farmers will uh, will have a lot of problems, and uh, I think they they are going to have a real crisis in uh, uh, in uh, farmer sector, in uh, agriculture sector of economy, and uh, uh, they are going to uh, to sell the, uh, their products in domestic markets. Uh, but uh, these markets are not so wide like Russian one. For the average consumer, what does it mean? Can we expect loads of queues in the supermarket for people to rush out and store up? What can we expect? Do you think anything dramatic like that is going to happen? Um, for uh, average consumer, uh, the main point now from this sanction is that uh, everybody are afraid of uh, price growing. But uh, government promised that uh, price will not grow a lot uh, about this sanction and uh, they will hold prices for uh, product which are under sanction now. Thank you ever so much. Alexei there, getting wet for us on the streets of Moscow, braving the elements there. Russia is believed to be considering the ban for European flights crossing its airspace to Asia. Now, the route the European flights currently take, it saves four to five hours in flight time and saves $30,000 for each flight flown. If Russia does decide to hit back using simple geography, then this is the route that European flights would then have to take. So it'd have to go below bypassing Russia altogether. Now, there is clearly, well, a lot more distance to cover there. It's longer and that would mean more cost too. Now, an airline source quoted by Vedomosti newspaper said that possible losses for Western Airlines could amount to 1 billion euros in just three months. Now, this week we witnessed international airline shares were down. We had Air France down, Lufthansa, Finnair and American Airlines as well. 
Now, Aeroflot also suffered too because the Russian airline collects royalties from foreign airlines for the right to cross Siberia, making nearly $200 million a year on average. So we witnessed its stock also dropped just because of the rumor. Now we've got Finnair just here. This is an example of the route that it currently takes. So it goes right through uh, Russia just there. So that would indeed change should this happen. But ultimately, it would be the consumer who would lose out. And Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, he denied such action would take place this week, despite the rumors, and for this very reason, actually, because of the holiday makers. Now, moving on, Russia and Iran agreed an historic $20 billion deal this week to bypass Western sanctions. The deal, not yet completely sealed, would mean Iran could avoid Western sanctions, which are aimed at curtailing the country's nuclear program. Russia-Iran trade is already worth $5 billion a year. So, to discuss the implications of such a partnership. Anis Abazid, hello, from the Arabic Channel. Thank you for coming in. I know you know this region very well, so I want to get your expertise on all of it. I suppose the question that first comes to my mind is, Russia has an abundance of natural resources. There's plenty of oil here. Why would they want Iranian oil? Well, before saying why Russia needs this oil, we need to know how much oil actually it will get from Iran. Mm -hmm. Because the numbers we've been hearing about the quantities vary significantly. One thing is if Russia would take, uh, say, half a million barrels per day of Iranian oil, this is one story. Another different story would be uh, buying only 50,000 barrels of Iranian oil per day. Mm. That's, a different, that's a different story. It's yeah. a huge yeah. difference. And obviously the implications of how much is huge as well. Uh, so we're waiting for the final details of that one uh, with bated breath as per usual. But one thing I do want to talk about, and we can discuss this, is what it would mean for the Russian ruble, because presumably the countries would be trading in that currency. Apart from the issue of the quantities you just referred to, Katie, uh, the, the issue of the currency of this trade is very important. Well, given that the both parties, Iran and Russia, of course, are subject to Western financial restrictions, uh, given that uh, it would make sense for, the, for them to trade in local currencies. And the ruble, Russian ruble here, uh, looks in a much better shape than, than the Iranian, Iranian real. Mm -hmm. uh, ruble is a much more stable currency. So uh, this option would allow the two parties to skip this uh, Western financial restrictions and to manage currency risk. Yep, so no longer trade in the euro and the US dollar, just be independent sure. from that. I suppose that's the idea. OK, so Russia's going to get Iran in oil. What's Iran going to get then? What type of industries would they even want from Russia? Russia is interested in selling uh, industrial goods, machinery, oil and gas equipment to Iran, and even agricultural goods, as Russian grain could find a market in Iran as well. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget that Western businesses are waiting uh, for a uh, Call, if I may say, from their politicians yeah. because they want to trade so much with Iran. And uh, well, but of course, that question uh, depends on whether the West and Iran would strike a deal on Iran's uh, nuclear program. Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, we are waiting for. And it's uh, being negotiated. Yeah, at but the Russia moment, now, isn't it? yes, sure, sure. But Russia now is moving beforehand and trying to secure a share in the Iranian market. Anis, thank you so much indeed for filling us in on all the details there. Very interesting stuff because it seems at the moment you've got the sanctioned against the non-sanctioned. And we know September the 9th and 10th, Russia's going to Tehran uh, to potentially seal this deal. So we're waiting to see what happens there and will we get a backlash from the US if they do. So we'll get you back in to talk about that. Why not? All right, Anise, thank you. Now let's focus on Russian businesses and see what companies have been hitting the domestic headlines this week. So Russia's fifth tour operator, well, it's gone bankrupt, which has left 500 Int Air customers stranded abroad, mostly in Greece, and another 1,300 booked to travel will not be able to do so. All people affected will be compensated. Russia's second largest oil producer, Lukoil, is going to sell a network of gas stations across the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary as it continues to scale down assets in Central Europe. The company is set to focus better on Russian projects. Russia's third biggest mobile operator, 
Vimplecom has seen the lowest rate of customer outflows in three years. The company shares are still down 37% though since the beginning of this year and that's largely due to weak performance in Russia, still the company's biggest market. Okay, now it is beer o'clock. Let's join mm. Tim Kirby. What are you up to? So it was beer last week. Oh, yeah. Hi, Katie. Well, Hello. for me, it is always beer o'clock. But then again, maybe it's actually not because I found out that legendary Russian brand Baltica has actually been completely bought out by Foreign Carlsberg. So unfortunately, our investment does not count because it's no longer trading. I made a little bit of an error. We have to get rid of Baltica, Oops. sadly, sadly. One of my favorite products on the wheel. And we'll replace it with something that's very Russian in both good ways and a couple bad ways. Tim, this makes me question, did you have too much beer before you put Baltica on the wheel? No, no, but when you look at the picture and you see that big frosty mug, you think, wow, oh, that yeah. is uh, definitely refreshing. But it's I have been trying to cut back a little bit on the beer. Maybe the audience has noticed the more slightly slender physique, but uh, oh. we'll see. So Fine let's form hope. of a man. Anyway, carry on. Thank you. But anyways, let's see what we get on the wheel to invest in this week. And hopefully it will be a, con a co country, a company that is at least mostly or partially Russian. So yes. it counts. That would be a star. <laughs> I think that yes, would definitely be a star. Uh, I'm not going to be too hard on you because you're still making money. That's the problem. It's difficult to criticize you. Oh, oh no. and you just said okay. about making money. Oftavaz just came up. I don't know how that happened. But uh, Oftavaz, the maker of the legendary Zhiguli car, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, not very renowned for being a very successful company in Russia. But let's see. You know, to Katie, to be honest, if I, I had one wish, I would love to be in charge of that company because they have all the potential, but they just never really realize it. Yeah, they so need we'll a little see. bit of encouragement. I reckon you're the man to do it if anyone's going to do it. So we've had, yeah. like, lots of manly uh, products, stocks to deal with. I mean, we have the beer, we've got the cars. So well, I reckon... Katie, I reckon I've got some faith in this one. Katie, look who you're talking to. This is a natural reflection of the person you work with. So, <laughs> so anyways, manly Katie, we'll man, see. You. Yeah, we'll see uh, if this extremely manly product works or doesn't work uh, next week in terms of the stocks. Okay. I think it won't, but we'll see. Tim Kirby, good for you. Well done. I know that the Russian car industry it has taken a bit of a battering in recent years, so mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see how that one will do it. Yeah. Uh, don't drink and drive, though. No, no, no. That, don't that's, do that. Yeah, that's one thing I don't screw around <laughs> with. I do, not, I do not screw around with that. Too so right. Hard. Okay, Thank Tim, you. always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Really informative this week, mm -hmm. and good luck with your cars, all right? Thank you. And that's a wrap for this week. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week. Stay tuned to RT for the news updates. Goodbye. Bye.